Hey there, strategic entrepreneurs. I'm Crystal Hunt. And I'm Michela Mitrani. We are here to help you save time, money, and energy as you level up your writing career. Welcome to episode 19 of the Strategic Entrepreneur Podcast. On today's show, we're taking an in-depth look at newsletter and mailing list systems or platforms. So the tools behind your sending out of your author newsletter or emails to your list that are going, of course, to be happening on a very regular basis. So we're going to dig into some of the tools that we use ourselves. We're going to talk about um, how you choose a tool that's going to work well for you. We're going to talk about different options and price points and some tips and things you would use to evaluate how effective or how good a match those tools are going to be for you. But my fine Italian friend, what have you been up to? A couple of things. Um, one of these is, of course, I'm keeping reading things and the book that I want to recommend for this week uh, might be known uh, to the majority of you, but I'm going to recommend it uh, nonetheless. And it's called How to Win Friends and Influence People uh, by Dale Car- Carnegie right? That's the way you pronounce it. Um, Now, I read this uh, um, some time ago, and the first time I have to confess, I thought um, it was like a title of a book that wants to manipulate people um, a few years ago, and I was kind of uh, scared to reading it, but I had so many people recommending it to me that I was like, I need to read and I need to understand what's, you know, the fuss about. And I also know that this book was written in, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the the Great Depression. So at the end of the 30s of the um, 20th century. And every single person that I asked to said, read this, especially if there were people like uh, business oriented uh, entrepreneurs. And so how to win friends and influence people, I went uh, over the title. And then I started diving in. And it turns out, at least for me, the title really, it represents some of the uh, content of the book. But really, the book is more like uh, understanding how human behavior, like how people really react to the way you talk, the way you react to um, news, jokes. Um, And it's not that much like a book of how to change people's behavior, but just shut up and listen to what other people are saying and learn from that. Um, and I think because we are talking uh, entrepreneur-wise, uh, it's important for us to understand the understanding part of things. And uh, we don't always shut up and listen. So um, an alternate title, title of this book could be Shut Up and Listen and Learn. Uh, but I found out that uh, this book is basically uh, a simple way to make a good first impression with people that don't know you. Um, How can you leverage your knowledge to other people? Um, What can you do when nothing else works? Um, I think every person that that is interested in uh, achieving some kind of endeavor, any kind of things that can be, can be writing a book or starting a business even, uh, should read this Uh, book for that reason. It's a book about a person that studied and interviewed a lot of successful people, and he knows what's behind the the word success. So I just wanted to take some time today to recommend this book because it's really good. And now it was almost as a century. Can you believe like almost a century old, but it's still current. Uh, It's still uh, powerful. And uh, it can be useful to listeners and viewers that are uh, planning on doing any kind of uh, um, endeavors wise. It might be to write a short story or, or a novel. I don't care about that. I just really liked it. And I think uh, um, one of the suggestions that the books uh, uh, give is like to reread the book a couple, couple of times because the second time's over, it's even better because you internalize most of the thing it says. And I do believe that uh, to be true. So uh, even though I think uh, (laughs) the first time that I saw that title, I was a bit scared. um, I do have to say I was wrong. And that is definitely one of the books that I will go over and over and over again, um, along with uh, uh, Think and Grow Rich, for sure, 100%. 
Uh, so that was the book uh, of uh, the week. Uh, but for the first time uh, ever, I'm gonna talk about another book. And this one is a fiction book and it's uh, by uh, Brandon Sanderson, um, The Way of Kings. And it's as huge, <laughs> it's very, very big. And uh, it's one of, uh, it's an epic fantasy. Uh, and um, I have been trying to get a bit more into the fantasy genre, the high fantasy kind of things. And I've uh, uh, heard amazing things about Brandon Sanderson, but guess what? I've never read anything. So I started with the, one of these uh, light, fine reading, uh, and I'm enjoying it. Uh, and uh, I think that it informed uh, the, the way I am uh, now writing uh, um, a short uh, fantasy endeavor. Uh, I wouldn't call it epic fantasy, but uh, it's definitely helping me out uh, on uh, that side of things. And um, as you know, my uh, 12 by 20 challenge is going uh, forward. I have published my sixth story to date, and now that makes the challenge completed at 50%, which is amazing. I'm, I'm still thinking about that, and I'm just uh, I'm blown, uh, I'm blown away. And uh, I feel I need to be thankful um, to the people that are following me, that are giving me feedback, which is the number one reason why I started this challenge. Of course, I need to thank uh, Crystal because she's helping me a lot, uh, um, not only in providing feedback, uh, giving me strategy to think about, uh, um, uh, but also because of the motivation uh, side of things. And that's uh, Crystal. I think like uh, we writers, uh, we need that kind of stuff. It's like the engine uh, is the fuel of the engine that powers us. Without that, we are basically nothing. Uh, we need uh, we need that force, the exterior force, uh, to just keep writing uh, our story. So that was me. Uh, that was my uh, week. Uh, what happened to my lovely, lovely uh, partner? Well, I have been feeling all inspired down the writerly rabbit hole and trying to get back into the part of the strategic authorpreneur business where one actually creates products and content because that is key. It's easy to get lost in the marketing and all of the other stuff, but at the heart of it, we have to be writing or we have nowhere to go. We have no new products. We have no actual growth. So that has been my focus over the last couple of weeks. And I have been missing writing in the magic. So I watched a, a couple of shows and I did some reading of some different books. I found a, a genre, a series of books actually that starts with one called Ever Strange and it is paranormal FBI stuff. So it's like magic plus uh, law enforcement kind of thing and it's, it's a romance and so I, I've been reading that and it just got me back into the mode of how much fun it is to play with magic and things so I have been working on um, one of the shorter stories that is called Luna and um, I'm doing a bunch of research for that so I have been reading the crystal bible uh, using it as a reference tool as I'm deciding what kind of amulets people need to have and what kind of jewelry they wear to you know enhance specific powers and things that they have and so that's just a really helpful resource that lets me kind of make sure that all the little details are lining up with what I want to do and as a fun aside, I did something that might might be totally insane or might be brilliant, <laughs> only time will tell, uh, is that one of my other series I'm working on, one of the characters writes under a pen name and his books appear in other books and his uh, series gets optioned to a TV show that one of my other characters ends up playing a leading role in and it's all very intertwined. And I found they weren't real enough. The books weren't real enough to me to make me able to talk about them in a kind of offhand fashion in the other things that I'm writing. And so I decided I needed to really flesh those out. So I had to actually make Finn a pen name and I had to figure out what he was gonna be writing and, and all of that. And so I actually created a pen name. I created a book trilogy complete with plots. I pulled some potential cover images and then I was like, 
these are really fun. I may actually want to write these books at some point and bring this pen name to life as a real thing. So I actually purchased the pen names website domain as well so that I can actually make the references to these books in the book a real link to an outside source. And, and I do anticipate actually writing those books at some point. I've been struggling with there's a couple things I really want to play with in the writing world that do not fit with my current branding and my current sort of they're they fit with the world I've created, but they really very different subgenre and more like crime thriller with a touch of magic. And so in order to branch out into that, I need a bit of a different identity there. So I think that I created myself and one of my characters, a pen name that we are going to share. He's going to have it in the book world and I'm going to have it in the real world. So that was a pretty fun, random adventure for this weekend. And uh, I'm excited to see where that goes. And part of the reason why I needed to switch my focus to this short story is because I missed the date by 24 hours to pull one of my stories out of KU that I wanted to use to refresh my newsletter list and use as a re-engagement uh, tool. And when I looked at them, in fact, almost all my stories are on the similar kind of cycle because I republished them all at once to make it easier to remember. <laughs> and um, what happened was I missed, I missed everything. So there was nothing I could pull out without waiting for three more months. So I decided it was faster just to write another story than it was to wait for that to come around so that I could use it again. So anyway, that's another piece and related to our newsletter topic of today, which is, you know, when you go to re-engage your list, often giving them something free to download is a good way to find out who's paying attention on your list and who is actually going to open and click and um, yeah, interact with whatever it is you're putting out there. So that has been what I was up to in the past week, which has been all kinds of fun, I have to say. Ooh, and the one other book that was really useful is, um, it's called Romance, Tropes, and Hooks by Karen Winter. It's super straightforward. There's nothing earth shattering in it. It's just like 500 different tropes and hooks for romance novels all summarized. And I like that when I'm doing short stories, I just kind of open it up and find one that appeals to me as a starting place. And then I make a couple of characters and then I can figure out what happens from there. So it's just a good like writing prompt book for me effectively. Um, so for any of you who are writing romance and looking to shake things up a little and get a little variety and or are writing short, it can be fun to write and group a series of shorts around a specific trope. And then you can box set them. And that is also a fun opportunity. So there you go. That is my, my summary of actions and also some resources for folks who are interested in those bits and pieces. And now, now we dig right into the meaty mailing list discussion. So there are a lot of mailing list tools out there and becoming more, it seems, by the week. And I think maybe if we start off with just talking a little bit about which tools each of us have used that would be helpful just so folks know what that we're coming from a place of experience around certain tools over others. So which ones have you got familiarity with, Michaela? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one thing that I wanted to just say uh, before, uh, that uh, if you are listening to us and you haven't started a newsletter or you're scared of the idea of starting uh, your newsletter or using tools like that, uh, I was there. I was there four months ago. I had no idea really what the newsletter was for, how to build a mailing list. Uh, so to all the people out there that are listening to us and they don't really know why are we talking about this, uh, again, I was with that, with you. Um, before like starting my challenge, I really didn't know uh, what this uh, very powerful element uh, uh, structured into the business of uh, being an entrepreneur um, and I really hope that uh, the experience that me and Crystal gather in the in my case in the past um, months and in our case in the, in the past years uh, are going to help you understand one important thing after your books uh, the most important thing for your outdoor business is building a strong engaged um, uh, mailing list there is nothing more powerful than that and there is no Facebook page uh, no other Jimmy Gimme tools 
that is going to make or break your auto business uh, like uh, a newsletter. And the emails, uh, again, for the people that are out there, maybe using uh, TikTok, one of the last uh, kids in the block, uh, the email are not going to go anywhere anytime soon. So it's something that really is embedded in uh, our way, basically to, to send messages and connect with people. So that's something that I just wanted to uh, have it uh, out of the way. So for anyone who is just getting started with mailing lists, there are a couple of masterclasses that I have put together on mailing lists and how you use them and some basics to kind of run you through how all of that works. And so if you're interested in those, you can find the links in the show notes and uh, then you'll be able to get access to those if you like as as a bit of a framework to expand on some of the things we're going to talk about. We are going to drill down into the tools specifically today, but we will definitely talk more about the other elements of mailing lists as we go forward too. So and that's going to be very useful for people that want to, as Crystal said, dive in into that uh, um, that subject. Uh, but I was saying uh, um, there are a couple of tools, mailing list uh, uh, wise, that I've been using in the past uh, few months. One is the big kid in the block is Mailchimp, which is basically been a um, mailing list uh, provider for a very long time. It's one of the most, uh, let's say, ancient service out there. And the second one, it's uh, it's an established service, but maybe not as uh, uh, known as uh, um, Mailchimp, which is uh, <clears throat> MailerLite. Uh, and there is another one that I'm really starting to um, getting to know, and I didn't really dive in into this one, but thanks to uh, my good friend Crystal, I now have possess this uh, this uh, instrument is sent fox and this is the equivalent of the new kid in the block because it literally didn't exist like a couple of years ago and correct me if i'm uh, wrong uh, crystal um and it's just another of these tools uh, that basically help you doing one simple thing which is a direct contact uh, with your fund and uh, again i can't stress enough how important uh, is uh, that you choose any of uh, the services. We are going to uh, speak a bit more of the differences between uh, each and every one of them so that you can hopefully have an idea of which one is more tailored uh, to you. Some of them are more expensive than others. Some of them are more user-friendly uh, than others. Some others give you a bit more analytics that you can really use to dig uh, in uh, to understand what is your audience doing and what is the behavior that they have. But yeah, I would say to answer your question is uh, Mailchimp uh, is the one that I've been using the most uh, and I'm more a bit more comfort comfortable with them. and then MailerLite uh, I've been using it for my Italian uh, newsletter um, and uh, Sandfox uh, is uh, the really uh, new uh, tool out there that I didn't use but I've heard very good uh, things and there is also as we are talking um, a good promotion on this tool um, we can dive in and speak about that a bit later on but these are the three that i know a bit more and um, i know that there are a couple of more more one is converti kit if i'm not mistaken and i've never used it what i do know about this it's it's a bit more expensive than the others but you can do way more things like it's a more specific uh, it's really professional and uh, it is recommended uh, it has been recommended to me by a couple of big uh, uh, indie author names. Again, I never had the pleasure of using it, uh, but as of now, everything I need is being done and performed very well by MailChimp and MailerLite. So I'm curious to know what are the one that you used, uh, if you have anything you want to add to what I said. Yeah, I have used... I think I've probably used upwards of 12 different mailing list services in the last 10 years, partly because I used to manage a lot of author clients communications with their readers, as well as my own author stuff. And so I've been able to see into the back end of a lot of other systems. And also because I have multiple businesses in various areas, we use different ones for different businesses as well. So I have actually used Drip, I've used ConvertKit, I've used MailPoet, MailChimp, MailerLite, SendFox, and probably half a dozen other sort of less commonly used ones. And it is really interesting to 
just see the similarities in them and also the subtle differences. So one of the biggest things I think that comes up when you're first choosing a mailing list service is going to be price because when you're getting started your mailing list isn't going to be making you a lot of money at first and so most authors will default to one of the ones that has a free learning option and ConvertKit did not have a free learning option and so for a lot of people that was kind of an instant default out of it and their starting place was about $30 a month and so when you're first getting started that is quite an investment it's one thing if you have a business you're running and you're using it as a sales platform and while our writer business is a business it's not the same as selling you know a hundred dollar pairs of jeans or something like that where you're using it like a store basically and so it doesn't take very many sales to justify paying out that money on a mailing list when you're dealing with some higher ticket items for things like our books, where probably what we're mostly using it for is sending out stuff we aren't charging people for, and then occasionally announcing a new release, which is where we do make some money from it, it isn't a direct revenue earner on its own. So MailChimp has always offered um, 2,000 subscribers before you have to start to pay, but the functionality is limited with that free account. So you can't do all of the automation stuff and everything else uh, the same way you can once you've unlocked it by paying. Whereas MailerLite gives you a thousand people for free to get started, but you get all the functionality. So it's a smaller group that you can have to onboard before you start paying, but the costs when you start paying are lower. And also you do have all the functionality, so you can really set up your list the way you want it to grow with you and have all of that good interactive stuff and get your automations all ready and functioning and then just scale up your numbers as you go and then the price scales up in in conjunction with the numbers scaling up but you don't have to start over or redo your processes so that is really handy um mail poet is an interesting one because it's a plug-in for wordpress that goes into the back of your site so the good news is you can you buy mail poet as a plug-in and then you don't have those ongoing fees in the same way so that's something to think about as well is just, you know, do you want to buy something that you just own or do you want to be basically renting it from someone else? And there are pluses and minuses in both directions. But um, for now, if, there, if you're looking specifically for something to put into the back end of your website, then MailPoet is something to think about. Um, Substack is also an interesting player on the scene right now, which I've also used. And that one is it's not really great for doing elaborate automations and stuff like that. What it is really good for is if you are a writer who is sending out, let's say, articles or nonfiction stuff to your audience, or you're building an audience you might want to monetize in some way, you can actually set it up so that subscribers pay $5 a month or whatever it is to be on your Substack list and get access to content that's just for your list. So it's kind of like Patreon, but it's really specific to sending out articles. And so it's great for journalists or for short story writers, or really if you want to monetize the content you're sending to your list, then that is uh, one that's kind of an up and comer on the scene. And they've done a lot of really cool things in the last while, which do that. Um, SendFox is, as Michele said, it's similar to the others. There is a free plan you can start with. You do have all the functionality on the free plan, so that's great. You can get in there and play around with it. And the reason why I've switched most of my stuff to SendFox is because it had an option to buy through AppSumo a lifetime code. So I was finding as I was growing my mailing list, it was getting to be really quite expensive each month. And I mean, for me, quite expensive was, you know, $50 plus uh, each month. But I have friends who are paying hundreds of dollars a month because their lists are 30 to 50,000 people. So if you're looking from a career growth perspective, it really depends where you're at. But I didn't want to get to the point where my mailing list was going to cost me $500 a month or even more than that. So for me to be able to buy a lifetime license with the SendFox to know that I can have up to 50,000 people and it will never cost me any more money, that was pretty motivating for me to make that switch. Um, yeah, I think that it's really, the good news is, it isn't that there's a right or wrong tool to choose. It's really how you're going to use it and finding the one that's the right fit for your budget right now and also that can grow with you in the way you're going to want to grow. 
So let's talk a little bit about um, how you decide which is the right one for you. So Michaela, are you willing to be a case study for us? And absolutely, you can give us a little rundown of when you were choosing your mailing list service. What were some of the questions you asked yourself or some of the things you had to think about in deciding which one to use? Absolutely. So one of the things that happened, and I'm going to tell you exactly what I did, uh, my first, uh, one of the first objective for my 12 by 20 challenge, I needed a service that did that, that delivered my stories uh, in exchange for the email address. So I actually needed two tools, two instruments to do that. One of these uh, was uh, um, MailChimp, my newsletter um, mailing list provider, and the other one was BookFunnel. BookFunnel is basically the tool that helped me with, along with MailChimp, to grow my uh, newsletter. But when I started uh, in January 2020, I had 75 people on my newsletter. This is a tool case study. I want to be extremely transparent on that point of view uh, because I'm going to show you a few things that I did uh, and the choice I made uh, in order to grow my uh, list. Um, I choose MailChimp and I want to specify this for my English newsletter. Then I choose uh, I choose the Mail Miller Lite for my Italian newsletter. But I just want to focus on the English side of things here. I choose Mailchimp because I knew how it worked, and the learning curve for me wasn't as steep as any other service that I didn't know. Uh, when Krista suggested me Sandfox and Miller Lite, I was like, "What? There are even other services that do other things." And I was like, "There is no way I have time to learn them." So. At the beginning, I was, uh, okay, there are 24 hours in a day. I have this time allocated to do this stuff. Most is going to my writing. So I need to use something that I know how to use already. So you see, my case was I needed something that worked basic and that uh, had me, give, gave me access to, uh, gave me some room to maneuver. So MailChimp did that for me because it gave me the freedom to have at least 2,000 people uh, as a bedrock of my uh, newsletter. So the choice number one was choose something that you know how it works. And MailChimp is not necessarily the more most user friend friendly now that I know other tools. So I want to get that out there immediately. I just used that because I knew how it worked, at least the surface of it. Uh, as Crystal know, automation and that kind of stuff, I, need, I didn't even know how to spell it. I still don't know how to spell the word. So, uh, but um, it did what uh, I needed it to do, provide me a base to welcome and to um, host uh, my newsletter subscribers. And the second thing was, was free. <laughs> this is something major for me, especially for people that are starting out. Uh, unfortunately, I do not have at this point uh, a lot of resources uh, money-wise. Um, let's speak frankly. <laughs> uh, I just started uh, um, doing these things uh, seriously on the English side. So I need something that A, I could use, and B, that did what I needed, which was to provide a place on the internet to host my followers. So that was the beginning of everything for me. What and why and how I use MailChimp uh, to grow my newsletter from 95 people. That's another thing that I uh, think it's interesting to, um, to point out. How did I use it, uh, MailChimp, to grow my newsletter from 95 people to um, around 900 people as we are, are talking now? Again, the very nature of the experiment of the 12 by 20 challenge was, uh, I'm going to provide to you free content that is something that only you can get if you um, subscribe to, that, to my newsletter. So my promise was, uh, I'm promising you, I'm gonna give you a short story. W what I need, the only thing that I need is your email address because I want to get feedback from you. I want to learn if I'm doing stuff right or wrong writing wise. I want to learn more about my crafting. And again, I don't see it now how you can do this on Facebook, for example, because on Facebook, as any other social media, there are so many things that compete for uh, the other people's attention. So if, you have, if I had started something like this on Facebook, uh, I don't think uh, it would have gone uh, well. While with MailChimp and uh, newsletter provider, 
you actually have the contact, the personal contact with the person. You can have, I had dozens of back and forth contact with people from the US, from Australia that I've never known and that provided feedback. There is no way something like that could have happened as easily with Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, you name it. And it's just the nature, nature of how a mailing list works. It nurture uh, more private and personal links. This was the very beginning of uh, uh, my newsletter revamp revolution, if you wanted to call it like that. So to answer uh, to your question, what did I do basically from that point? I made sure that I stick to uh, my plan to release one story every month um, uh, in exchange for uh, a bigger audience. And it worked uh, because I was consistent and hopefully because my story were not too boring. So other people started talking about them, even on social media, on Instagram, for example, uh, and Facebook uh, about these stories and the fact that, hey, there is that guy, which I can't pronounce the name, uh, that is doing this 12 by 20 challenge. Um, and so the word of mouth was also something that helped uh, uh, with the newsletter uh, list growing. But the other tool that I was mentioning was book funnel. And book funnel was from where most of my new um, subscriber came from. But again, if you just have book funnel, but you do not have a way to integrate that tool with a the newsletter, there is really no way for you to get the retention of the readers. So I would say 70 to 80% of the people that are now in my newsletter come from book funnel, from the book promo that I've been part to. And Krista has been in many of those book promo. If I'm not mistaken, she also created some. Um, I don't want to go too deep into the book funnel thing because we already spoke about that. But this is basically the way I use MailChimp. The second way I use, uh, I've used it and I'm still using it is um, I take a lot of time when I'm uh, in the back end of MailChimp. Every single time I send a newsletter, a new newsletter, to see who's opening it, what kind of title of the newsletter elicit more interest, what kind of phrasing, what kind of wording, um, what kind of call to action get uh, answered the most. These are all things that I found uh, it's easier for me to understand on MailChimp because for me, again, statistics wise, is stronger than other services like Sandfox and MailerLite at this point in time, or at least I'm more familiar with them at this point in time. Um, so I'm using that to understand a bit more about my audience, my newsletter uh, audience. And for example, today I sent uh, uh, a newsletter to those uh, 900 people and I already got people answering. Uh, um, um, and I saw the number, uh, because there was a link that went uh, directly to my website, how many people clicked it, how many people interact. And for me, that's, that's gold, because I really get to understand what's working and, and what's not working on the way I interact with these people, which are strangers that are interested in what I'm doing. So to answer your question, it's been a learning curve, even though I kind of knew how MailChimp worked, but for example, three months ago, I didn't have a welcome message, which is like a huge bummer. Like it's, it's bad. If you don't have that, um, it's like um, basically somebody is introducing himself or herself and you are almost spitting it uh, in her or his face. You are supposed to have uh, like a welcome message uh, to make people know um, that subscribe to your newsletter, who you are, what are you doing? And luckily enough, MailChimp at least has one automation which is like sending one welcome email to people that subscribe to newsletter as crystal said on that side it's not very powerful other services like mail mailer light do a way better uh, job at that uh, but yeah so that's the way i've been using uh, mailchimp that's the way it helped me uh, to keep track of how my audience was growing and uh, how they were interacting with the kind of uh, uh, content I was providing uh, on a, a weekly or monthly uh, basis. And I'm just curious to know, uh, if I may, Crystal, you did use a, a plethora, a different number of services. 
And I was wondering not only how these services compare to MailChimp, Mail, uh, which is probably one of the choices that are more uh, talked about out there, how does it compare with the other services? But really, what is the value that you think this one gives uh, compared to others? And if there are choices that are maybe better for people that are starting out uh, right now? Okay, so uh, ConvertKit, I loved using ConvertKit. It's fantastic, but it's, it's expensive. So for business, we used ConvertKit for years for the Creative Academy. That was our go-to. You can tag people. Uh, into different groups. The functionality was just really cool. You could do a lot of really advanced stuff. And at the time, there weren't a lot of other services that were offering those same functions. So very cool. If you could afford ConvertKit, go nuts. It's it's wonderful. The, the folks were so great with their tech support and with the help articles and everything else. So really cool product. Um, definitely shout out to that. It can do anything you could ever want it to do. And um, the interface is relatively easy to use. It's not the easiest of all of them, I think, but it's, it's really functional. And considering the level of difficulty or complexity of what you could do with it, it I think it deals with that really well. Um, for MailChimp, I, I like the interface, but it used to be easier to use, I, I think, in my opinion. It used to be a lot more kind of simple in how it's put together. And as someone who has used it for more than 10 years, I actually have a hard time with the interface now a little bit. It's gotten it's gotten less user-friendly as time has gone on and they've added various other restrictions onto the free accounts and different ways of doing things. So I think it's really, it's great. It's, it's super useful, it's very powerful. Deliverability is high, which is something we haven't really talked about, but when you're when you're analyzing a potential mailing list service, you have to look at their deliverability scores. And so there is an article or a ranking that comes out at least once a year that rates all the different email providers. And when we say deliverability, we mean the ability to actually get your email into someone else's inbox because just because we send it doesn't mean it makes it all the way to the people on the other end of things. And there are some things you can do to help that, but there's some stuff that's built into the tool that you choose. So there's tons of smaller, more obscure kind of services and lots of them that are sort of perma-free to use, but they don't always have the best deliverability. So that is something to watch out for. Um, one other challenge, MailChimp has great deliverability. MailerLite is right up there. SendFox is right up there. Convert kit as well, like any of those ones, you're going to have really comparable deliverability. Um, but one of the things to watch out for with MailChimp is that a lot of authors were struggling with it because it was built for business. There is a really quick trigger to shut down any spam accounts. It's part of how they keep it with such good deliverability is by saying, okay, if you get more than X number percentage of unsubscribes, we're going to freeze your account because we think you might be adding people who don't want to be on your list. But the way that author promotions work is that if you run a book funnel promo, you might have a thousand people who sign up just to get a free book. And then the first time you send something out, it's unsubscribe, 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 which is what you want because you don't want the people on your list who don't want to stay there. And you're counting on them having got the free book, reading it, loving it. And maybe they re-sign up later, or maybe they just go buy all your other books or read them in KU which is great, but from a business perspective and looking at the way MailChimp treats that, it's not great. So a lot of authors found that they would run a book promo and their account would get shut down because people would be unsubscribing from that initial welcome email. And so uh, MailerLite was a little bit less strict about that. And so that's why a lot of authors were turning to MailerLite because a, you could start with your free account and you could get all the functionality in it. And then you could also um, be running your promos and not having the same level of trouble about your account getting shut down. So that was, uh, I think, a common reason why a lot of people made that jump. The inside mailer light, the automations are super clear. I really like the groups functionality. The interface is pretty straightforward. They've been adding functionality. You can do landing pages and full websites and all kinds of stuff in mailer light. It's, it's very, very powerful now. And it's very, I think, user friendly, but also it's complicated if you really just want to send an email to your subscribers. So um, I think that's where SendFox 
as a newer kid on the block, they don't, they have automations. The automations I find very easy to use actually in Zenfox and it's a nice clean interface. It makes lots of sense. It's not quite as high powered as MailerLite or MailChimp or ConvertKit yet, but I've noticed I've only um, been using it for maybe five or six months and it has drastically grown and dramatically grown over the last few months. And so features are being added on kind of a weekly basis. Seems every time I log in, they've added something new. So it's definitely growing and it's catching up, but I think what it has going for it right now is two things actually. The first thing is the, the simplicity of it that you log in, it's not a ton of really over-designed templates. It's really focused on like sending an email to your mailing list, which is as authors, really what we want to be doing is making that direct connection. And then the second thing is that the price is currently very right. So it, it was designed for creators to use, to send out to people. And so the, the base plan gets you in there for free. And then there are all these deals right now where you can still, we'll link to it from under the episode in the show notes. You can grab it from AppSumo and you can, can get like $50 was 5,000 people on your list for life. And so for me, I stacked some coupons. I took my, my budget from my mailing list for six months out of this year. And I spent all of that at once on SendFox, which got me the capacity of 50,000 subscribers for the rest of my life or the life of the tool. Let's be honest, it is possible that, you know, tools don't always last forever. So it is important to make sure that you are just aware that things change over time. But for me, I knew as long as the tool keeps going for more than six months, I've got my money out of it. But that does bring us to one other point, which is you won't necessarily want to keep the same tool for the entire time of your life and the entire time of your creating life. And so it's really good to just make sure you know when you're analyzing a mailing list tool, what is your ability to export your list and bring it into something else. If you start in MailChimp, for example, and you use that until you get to 2,000 people, you can then export your list and move over to another mailing list provider. There's nothing that says you have to stay with the same one forever. So you just have to make sure that the format you can export your contacts in is one that's functional. Now, all of these mainstream ones make it super easy to export from one and import to another. Uh, it just comes out as a CSV or basically an Excel spreadsheet and the, the list is then uploadable somewhere else. So that is not a problem. It's more if you're using kind of an obscure one or one that you know isn't in that list of like the six main ones that you really need to check and make sure that there is a way to get that data out in a way that's usable. And I would say the last thing to really check is with any of your mailing list services, what other of your tools does it have to play nice with? So for me, I was like, oh, SendFox looks amazing, but I use BookFunnel for everything. That's how I deliver my free reads. It's how I deliver free audiobooks. I needed something that was going to interface with all my other tools. And so I needed to know that I could make it work with my WordPress website. And could I make it work with BookFunnel? And when I looked it up, I discovered that SendFox integration had just been added to BookFunnel. So that was for me the last kind of barrier where I was like, yeah, I'm in, okay. But for you, whatever newsletter service you're looking at, if you're going to use BookFunnel for promos and for um, just delivering your cookie, your newsletter list freebie, then you wanna make sure that it integrates because you do not wanna be doing that stuff manually, the whole point of using these tools and being a strategic entrepreneur is to really make sure that you have the ability to scale up in numbers and volume and sales without scaling up the effort that it takes on your part. So I think those are some of the key things to really look at when you're thinking about which tool is going to be the right one for me. And above all, do not panic. <laughs> in the words of Douglas Adams, don't panic. Stuff will happen. You will make mistakes as you're learning. If you stick around to the uh, end of the episode, there's me telling a story about something that went terribly wrong and how I fixed it uh, and how I sort of bounced back from that. I'm not going to include it now because I don't want to make you all panic. But if you're feeling brave, listen to the story and hear how I recovered from that. 
Um, but I do think it's just really important to remember you're on a learning curve, you're building a relationship with your readers, and that you can always change things. Get in there, do your best for now, and you can always do a mailing list makeover, just like we do a book sales makeover, and that that is not a problem. Is there anything else you want to add in there? Only the, the last thing, uh, um, you hinted uh, something it's something interesting. We have been talking about the tools and the options, but one thing that we didn't address maybe was uh, we didn't talk about uh, is uh, once you have all the system set up, what do you send them? What kind of messages do you send them? And I think what you said about uh, the personal, it like personalize as you go, as you evolve, uh, it's meaningful and it's important. I had no idea four months ago, what kind of content to provide to my newsletter. Uh, because simply I had no content. I had no, except for a couple of books. But now that, that I have this challenge, uh, I have uh, constantly a stream of uh, news that I can provide to my followers in the newsletter. And I'm sure in six months, the thing is going to be dif different. In the case, for example, if I'm lucky enough to create a box set with a series of novellas that I'm putting together, uh, if uh, I'm collaborating with another author of my same genre, the content that you provide is always yourself, but the meaning and the shape uh, that you're giving to it can change, can shift a bit. Your voice remains as such. It can shift at you, yes, but they know you as Crystal Hunt, Michela Mitrani. They know uh, the person that I, I've subscribed to. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, he's... Um, doing this challenge there is something kind of particular uh, she is making providing content uh, on medium if uh, they are uh, uh, subscribed uh, to that kind of newsletter or maybe she's providing content on the roman side that's basically your message that what you are but that doesn't mean that you cannot change or experience or, or experiment different things i'll tell you in this past four months i did do some experiment because i wanted to see what kind of audience I had, how did they uh, answer to specific kind of email. So for example, the first three or four uh, stories, I didn't do an email which sent the cover reveal uh, a week before of my story that was about to be released. There was no cover reveal. But when I started to do the cover reveal um, uh, newsletter, and I've noticed that people were clicking and were interested, I started using that then as an integral part of the process of engaging with my existing audience. So now every single time I know what's the cover, usually a week before the release of the new story, uh, I release that uh, as a special uh, um, bonus uh, uh, material to my subscribers. So you see it changes. I just wanted to add this in small parentheses. The content you provide depends on you and the books that you have written or the stories you have written, the things that you are doing. You can be a science fiction author, you can be a fiction, uh, sorry, a non-fiction author. It depends on you really. But what I would say is test different things, of course, in the limit of uh, uh, the politeness. Um, be uh, wary of the get rich quick schemes kind of things uh, just try to grow your audience slowly but steadily and most of all the most important thing ask i in my newsletter i ask several times about things and i got answers uh, and i've learned from them and i got some of my better readers like a half a dozen uh, uh, half a dozen uh, better readers because i've asked if somebody was interested in reading my stories and providing feedback so it all started from you asking the right questions. So I think like it's important for us, Krista, to let the audience know that uh, they do have ways to provide value with their messages. They just need to find uh, what kind of message is that for them. Definitely. I think we should dig into the content of mailing list stuff on a future episode. I think that would make a really interesting discussion. And if you are looking for a couple of resources to help you with that content part to go with the uh, tool part, then you can dig into the Newsletter Ninja by Tammy Lebrecht is one book that talks about what kinds of things can go in a newsletter and gives you some tips about deliverability. If you're looking to something for something to help you write headlines or subject lines, and you're also looking at 
uh, a great formation of kind of an onboarding sequence, the book Sell Like Crazy by Sabri Subi, which we'll link all of these for you in the show notes, is also a good starting place. And that one is a really sales focused book, but the second half specifically really digs into how to format a welcome sequence and what your opt-in pages, which is basically what a free newsletter cookie is when you're giving something away to get people to opt into your newsletter, and then how you follow that up with a sequence of things that will help make sure your emails are deliverable, how you get people to add your address to their contacts and to, we call it whitelisting, to make sure that their mailing list provider or where their email provider knows that your emails should go into their inbox, not into the junk or spam folders. So there's all kinds of stuff to dig into there. But for now, go out, do some analysis on which tools you want. And while you're thinking about that, we are going to visit the curious jar and find out what question we're going to be tortured with today. (laughs) So as usual, I will dig around. You tell me when to stop. Stop now. A pink one today. Okay. Ooh, yikes. Okay. If you found out you had one month left to live, how would you spend it? Oh, shit. <laughs> I knew this kind of questions about the meaning of life and a very profound kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah, you so. know, it's a little bit on the deep side, but there we go. Okay. Okay. I can start. Can I start with by quoting one of my favorite authors um it's your month man you do with it as you will yeah so um so isaac asimov was uh uh, related to have uh, answered the similar question like what you would what would you do if you have like your doctor said you had like three or six minutes left to live and his answer was i would uh type faster um uh i really (laughs) think like if i have one month uh, if I really type fast you know, on my key a keypad um, keyboard, uh, I would be writing uh, a couple of novellas. So I would be doing my um, my, my my challenge would be like a, um, uh, fast forwarded. But yeah, I would I guess like my answer would be since I treasure um, the writing part, I would definitely spend more time, uh, even more time than usual, trying to write uh, maybe a, not the difficult books. The one book that you were like, I'm not really there yet, uh, and I still, and I have a couple of books like that. Um, I don't know about you, Crystal, but you know, like there is that book. It's the book that I want to write, but I'm not quite there skill wise. Um, so I would probably give it a go. Anyways, that's the uh, last month, and I make sure to spend as much time as possible with my family and my close friends because that's uh, the most important thing that. It comes from my tradition, uh, being an heritage, being Italian, family is everything to me. And I mean it uh, when I'm saying it. Um, uh, so yeah, so it would be like reading, writing, uh, and spending time uh, with my uh, family, most of all. And uh, let's end with something profound, I guess. Like, uh, um <laughs> I think I already quoted this uh, by Seth Godin. Uh, he said, um, who would miss you when you're gone? Uh, I think like we as writers um, have an advanced advantage over other people that like don't write for uh, as a passion, uh, which is like the, one, the moment we die, basically. A piece of us is going to be there and it's going to be part of the human uh, uh, knowledge. Um, it might be, maybe you are in the, it's not like your stuff is going to go end up in, on Wikipedia, but if any of your people that goes after you can be family member and stuff, they will be like, oh, there was that uncle or that grandfather that brought that. So a piece of you is immortal. Let's, let's face it. Like you can't die that way, really. So I will make sure that in the month uh, I write as much stories that I can so that people can talk about that and the person that was writing them. What about you? <laughs> I, I gave uh, you my five cents on that the tricky uh, jar question. What about, uh, what, what's, what's Christoph's story? Yeah, I think, I'm not sure how hard I would push to write more fiction, to be honest. I think I would 
probably on the writing side, focus on writing letters. Uh, I, I do a lot of nonfiction writing as well and a lot of sort of blog articles and, and just trying to write my head clear, if that makes sense. I find it, I when I'm writing about things, I have to think about them in a different way than when I'm just thinking them. So I definitely process through writing. So I think for me, there would be a certain amount of writing to people specifically. I would want to write one story uh, for sure for my readers, but I also would want to write letters to my, you know, my, my daughter, my husband, my family, things that could kind of appear later um, and arrange to have them sent at some future date. I've always thought that was, um, well, I've been on the receiving end of some of those letters and they are very powerful. And I think a nice way to stay engaged uh, at a moment when those important moments, you know, and there's some milestones and things like that that come. So I think that would definitely be a thing. I think there would be some good friends and some cocktails and um, we've done a lot of traveling, which is great. I don't feel the need to go off and be somewhere else. I think it would be, you know, being cozy at home and just really having as much quality time as possible with the people that I love. So real and imagined. <laughs> I can always hang out with the people in my head anytime I want. <laughs> I think that's an interesting kind of side conversation is that I, I don't, I don't write necessarily just to share it with other people. I actually have fun creating that world and, and visiting it for myself. So I think, um, yeah, that would be an interesting thing to see is how much needed to be external and how much is just that I need to feel some closure for me. But I would like to think that if something happened to me, other people out there could pick up River's End and write stories in it and that the characters in the town would still keep on going even without me. I think there's plenty of other people who could also tell those stories. So I would really hope that that would be the case. So maybe one of the things I would do is write a letter to uh, future writers who might be writing in my world just to kind of say, hey, this is where I was going with this. And this is how I hope you would use the pieces um, in terms of it being a a friendly, welcoming, open place and um, just having it kind of, it, I mean, it already has a life of its own. So I feel like that is something that will kind of outlive me, which is good. Now we want to know what would you do if you found out you had one month left to live? What would be on your priority list and how would you go about spending that time and getting the most out of it? And if you want to send us a curious jar question, you can email ideas at strategicauthorpreneur.com and we will add it to the jar. You can see we're kind of dwindling here. We've got a few colors, but we could always use more questions. So strategicauthorpreneur.com or you can drop your answers in the comments below uh, the video if you're watching on YouTube as well. And as always, uh, for show notes, links to resources that we mentioned, and for coupons or discounts on tools we love, please visit us at strategicauthorpreneur.com. Also subscribe to the newsletter, and each week we'll make sure to email you just one thing that we think will help you on your entrepreneur journey and a link to our latest episode. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on our next episode where we will be talking with special guest Bonnie Goldberg about converting your previously traditionally published books into indie published books and how you can update and give new life to your back catalog. See you next week. Um, Mailer light they first had like all the automations and everything and I had it all set up and it was great and I there was this box that was like default checked which was if somebody comes back on your list like resend stuff out or whatever mm -hmm. I can only assume that that was the part of the automation that created the problem but what happened is somehow in the back end it created this loop 
where somebody would sign up and then it would just keep firing the welcome email at them. Oh, and my welcome email is like, hey, are we BFFs now? <laughs> <laughs> and it sent it, I think, two, I think 2,837 was the most times it sent it to one person. It was like firing it out like once a second. Nobody told you anything? Well, so I sent it and I had, I don't know how many people, I probably had 3,000 or 4,000 people on my mailing list at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but it was only the new people who, <clears throat> who were signing up who had that happen. And I think there was like nine or 10 people that signed up and it started sending out. And I got emails back from a couple of them that were like, what is happening? Like I signed up and now my inbox is getting crushed and I have thousands of emails. And I was like, <laughs> but the thing is, it was the night before a mm -hmm. giant book funnel promo was starting that my books were part of. Shift. And so it's like midnight and I'm this book funnel thing is going live like momentarily and mm. I'm like, oh my god Anyone who signs up is gonna like this is what's gonna happen. So oh, I just shit. like slammed the stop button and Was like turned off the form. <laughs> I was like nobody can sign up and then just Scrambled to try and figure out what went wrong and I contacted Mailer Light and there was like Oh, somehow you've managed to find this glitch that no one else has ever found. <laughs> I was like, yay, lucky me. Um, <laughs> so then I had to send out a message to the people like who were on my list who had yeah. been totally spammed. Spam, and yeah. I, I basically, I deleted them from my mailing list so that it couldn't keep sending them stuff because we couldn't figure out how to turn it off. And so... Mm. Um, Anyway, so I deleted them from the list and then I sent them a personal message that said, I'm so sorry, um, I've removed you because that was the only way we could stop this technical glitch from happening. And, you know, a million apologies. I'm the only way to get rid of all those emails is going to be to just delete them from your inbox. And basically just, I don't, I don't know what else to say other than, you know, thanks for helping me discover this glitch because if it had been the next day, like, I think I had 2000 people who signed up over the next um, 10 days through the other promo that I was doing. And they wow. would, that would have happened to every single one of them. Like it would wow. have just been an absolute disaster. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So the message I sent out was basically, I'm so sorry about this. It's going to take you some time to undo that. If you are willing to resubscribe, you know, it's fixed and it, everything should be okay. I totally understand also if you're not willing to resubscribe. And I was like, here's a link to download a free copy of all of my books. And mm. then you can get them without having to be on my list. And basically just, I'm sorry and thank you. And, <laughs> and actually a bunch of those people ended up being on my review crew in the oh, end. So it was so an really interesting personal. way to like oh. translate it from yeah. like, oh my God, the world is ending to actually this turned out fine but it's so scary when something like that goes wrong. yeah and again that's one of the reasons why i just try not to tweak too many things at the same time especially if i'm not familiar with the tool yeah well and this was just they had a new function which like they had just added the automation sequencing stuff in mailer like because they didn't really mm -hmm. used to have that and so yeah, it was, I just, I just activated one automation sequence and it was a default thing that they had put in. Um, yeah. So anyway, they were very apologetic and uh, we got it all worked out, but there was not a lot of sleeping that night. And then I was just like panic checking my email, like every five minutes to make sure that as people were being onboarded, it didn't start happening to anyone else. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, you see something that it will never happen to you again because you're going to check now. Well, there's no way to check. Like there will be glitches. Like this is a problem in the programming of the thing. And there's nothing to check for. Like wow. it really is. It's just that something happened on the back end and it got stuck and they, mm. they couldn't explain why it happened or how it happened. Um, it, it just did. And there, there is stuff like that. Like mm -hmm. um, each of the platforms has their own quirks, especially when you're using newer ones. So I think it's worth talking about just stuff that does go wrong that isn't it's not your fault there's nothing you can do except choose how you respond to it yeah um, how do you react to it in, in this yeah. case your example is a good one like you pivot the situation so yeah yeah it, it worked out it was okay <laughs> but definitely you know but i can see the fear in your face when you were relating the story oh my god it was and it was this was pretty early on as well like i'm a little more 
like I've seen so much go wrong to various people at various times now and I like we've done all the mistakes you could do so I'm a little more blase about it because I'm like well we've done all of these things and it's still okay like it just (laughs) but in the moment it feels horrendous yeah yeah 